pulling. Um, I think some of you were here a few weeks ago for the first part, where I basically presented about this place called Oroville. It's quite unique, um, since there aren't many very successful, um, large, very international, there's 58 countries in Oroville. Um, there's 10 schools, it employs 6,000 people, so it's a complex, intricate, 53 years young, um, and I'd say successful community, international community. And I think a lot of us were dreaming, probably from a young age, of community. I think it's, it's, it's a common dream when you wake up um, to wanting something more in life, you know, not just this individualistic life which is kind of forced on us in, in one way, and through education and through systems. Um, Capitalism does well of sort of making us want to, to sort of hoard and not share. And, you know, it has its merits. Every system has its merits. But I was always dreaming. And then when I was 19, I went to live in a kibbutz for a year. And it was a very formative experience. And ironically, my father had lived in the first kibbutz after World War II. He was, um, he was a soldier and he happened to end up in Palestine, which became Israel. And he was on Daganya Aleph, the first kibbutz. So there was this kind of lineage in my family of community that I didn't actually know about and I only discovered later. And um, my background is I'm an academic in the field of Indology. So I do study ancient India, which is quite an interesting subject. But more recently, I'm working with UCT with the San and the Khoi, um, with the linguistics, with what's called endangered languages or languages that are spoken by very few people. And um, so I work academically on the one side, but I also live in Oroville. And I started five years ago to study communities broadly and to look at models of community. You might have heard of the 400 plus kibbutzes. And um, then do a comparative and then say, can we make a blueprint? I mean, everyone knows if you want to say start a company in Silicon Valley, there's a model. There's a, there's a blueprint for you. You know, you start a company, you get your equity, you get your investors, you do your round A, round B. Um, but it's not so easy to find blueprints for creating successful communities. And this is really what... I'm going to talk about today. And the last talk was focusing on Oroville and saying, is this a successful blueprint and can we improve on this and can we model on this? So if you weren't there for the last talk, Judy kindly recorded it and it is available so you can watch it if, if some of the things... I will do a very quick recap today, but I'm going to actually focus on how we're going to actualize it in South Africa and can we do it and, and how will we do it? So this is part two. It's called Oroville and the Community Solution. And um, I'm Martin Gluckman, that's my name. So John Lennon in 71, he wrote this song called Imagine. And um, of course, everyone knows it. I think it was voted the most successful song after yesterday in the world. And it, it touches on like, imagine there's no countries, nothing to kill or die for, no religion, life in peace, um, living in peace and no possessions, um, no greed or hunger. You know, so it's this kind of utopian, idealistic ideas. And often the life I've lived in Orville the last 15 years, I keep thinking back to the song and I think, wow, it's actually reflecting. He was dreaming of something. He's saying imagine, but actually uh, large amounts of elements that are touched upon in this, this beautiful song, very beautiful song, um, are actually manifest there. And the question is for the next 100 years, how can we duplicate that kind of idea and actually make this a kind of global movement and interlink them? And specifically in South Africa, how can we do... Um, at least one here and then maybe a network of communities in South Africa. And I know a lot of you already, like I lived in Red Hill before living in Orville and there was a community there. There are these, I'm sure Nodok has elements of a community and elements of a conscious community. It's a very conscious place to live. Um, but when you create a, a place and you say this land is for the community, it really allows for it to grow and develop. It's the difference with so between sort of having an informal school or saying this is a school, you know, and... Um, so when you give it a container, it really allows it to thrive. Basically, I walked everyone through um, the vision and the dream of Oroville, and then um, a recap. It was I was just introducing Oroville. It is in Southeast India, and I spoke about the founders um, and the idea of integral yoga. So this, it's connected to this very old, thousands of year yogic tradition, um, which India has sort of contributed, many of you know. But the idea in Oroville is all life is yoga. So everything you do is, is a... Is a a step towards yoga means to unite or to join. So it's a, it's a step towards oneness, we could say, in a broader way. 
And there was a dream, this is in 1954, I'll show you, and then there's a charter. So it's got a clear vision. It doesn't really have rules. The, the mother who seeded Orville, she said she doesn't want rules. Um, she only really made rules when she had to, and, um, but there, is, there aren't really rules. She called it a divine anarchy, basically. But there are <laughs> guidelines, and there's a dream, basically. Um, and it was inaugurated in 1968. There were people from 124 countries that put soil from around the world. Um, it has a plan, a town plan. Um, it's autonomous in its own planning. It doesn't uh, wait for municipality or government. It's for its own planning body. Um, it gives a lot of freedom, which I've learned now looking at models for South Africa. The zoning laws of the municipalities are a big question we're going to touch upon because people think you can just go and take a farm and make a community. You can't, basically. Um, but I've been meeting with town planners and zoners and studying, um, and I'm going to show you a few models in South Africa, like Camp Hill, like Honeyville, where they have figured it out. And then also, once we set a precedence and we do it successfully for one community, it will be very easy easy to do um, more in South Africa. But Orville has clear zones. It's got a cultural, an inter international, an industrial, and a residential zone, basically. And then in the middle is a big peace zone. So it's like a kind of central, big peace park, a very, very beautiful space. I think one of the my favorite places in the world. Um, it's called the Matramandir. It's, this, um, it's a place for meditation. There's no dogma or no religion there. You're free to do whatever practice you want. Um, you don't have to go there. Um, it's, not, it's, it's not a cult. It's basically just a place for silence in the middle of the community. Um, and then we were talking about what it was before. These are very small because it's just a recap. But it was basically barren land. It was like going into... Well, the Karoo is a bad example because it was forest hundreds of years before. And then it was deforested um, in the French time, and um, it was reforested. So what they did is they went to the temple groves in South India, and they looked at what were the trees. The temples were preserving little forests, each temple in India. And they said, um, and then they replanted all the trees that were there before. So they kind of um, reforested it. It's, it's planting of three million trees. Um, and then a lot of work on water. We built our own roads from our own bricks. We make our own bricks for the own roads. Um, so we don't bring asphalt and petro petrochemical roads. Um, and we have the UNESCO chair for earth building, so they're done properly. It's not just a hodgepodge road, it's a, it's a proper road that lasts as long as any other road or longer. And then of course we've got lots of paths that are for us. We focus on natural building. There's a huge emphasis on beauty and aesthetics and the architecture. These are just tiny little micro slides because they're assuming you've seen it, but I'm just recapping. We've built buildings just for a poem. We've got a, a rammed earth library. Um, I was in uh, Patton Austin, I saw a beautiful old library there that had been restored of the earth building, so I was very touched by that. Um, and um, this is a housing project that won an award, a green building award. It's for youth, it's free housing, basically under 40 you can get a house there just by working in Oroville. That um, was just an example of housing. The overarching purpose is human unity. Um, and then these are just touching, we've got fiber optics running through the community, we've got tons of commercial units that give their profits towards Oroville. And they, pay, they are tax free, so they pay tax towards Oroville, not towards the government. And huge awareness of waste and ecological and green practices. And uh, it's OK. And um, safety, we also have a safety team that's internal, like kind of security. So we want to make the place as safe as possible. This is a big question for South Africa. And also a big reason to do communities is that you're much safer in a community. Um, and the kibbutz was actually formed. One of the ideals, there was Zionism, and the other idea was to be a place, a safe harbor, basically, and to grow in safety. And I think in South Africa, there's a dire need with, there's one uh, farm murder a week and about 60 murders a day in South Africa. So safety is a huge, it's the fifth most dangerous country in the world at the moment. Mm. We went up <coughs> to the eighth. <laughs> okay, so uh, we make our own clothing. I'm not wearing um, Oroville clothing tonight. I need it to be a bit formal. But we do make um, all sorts of clothing. And we have cotton projects. Um, of course, food. We have um, a number of farms. And um, about um, 25 farms at last count. Um, and um, we have a communal eating place, which is really nice, especially, like, say, you're a mom. You've had a, you don't have to eat in the communal eating. But there's a organic, mostly organic, from our own gardens, mostly um, fresh buffet every day, and that's cooked on sunlight. So this is a great um, place also of meeting and unifying, and um, a lot of people who visit, and my kids, like it's their favorite place in Orville, I think 
it's got a lovely vibe, the kids play, and it's in an earth building. So I'm just giving you a taste of what I talked about in detail. That's the solar dome, and that's the solar kitchen from the top. <coughs> and, um, well, we do a lot of outreach, and this is a big thing. Um, so we employ 6,000 people. We have um, health care and also educational. We have three schools that we run. We have 800 students at any time that are not Auroville children. They're children from the surrounding villages. And the whole idea is really to bring up everyone. And it's a really good education. It's completely free. It's holistic. Um, a lot of those kids go on to become members of the community. So you're really building a new society and a new world. Um, and of course, we have a lot of emphasis on the arts. There's international pavilions. So the idea is to have all cultures represented there. Um, education is very strong. I mentioned there's 10 schools. And we'll look at the statistics just now. Um, and we're constantly having festivals. So we'll have, in COVID, it slowed down, um, of course, because you can't have big public festivals. But we had an endangered craft mela just before um, uh, I presented this. And um, we did a conscious fashion festival last year. So we'll do, it's a bit like, I used to go to the Grahamstown Festival, which was on arts and was amazing as a kid. And it's like, there's always a festival there, so and it's always free. You know, there's nothing, there's no money in Grahamstown. You you know money, you don't go to Grahamstown. Um, if you want to go see theatre or dancing and you don't have money, you're you're deprived in South Africa largely. In Oroville, it's all free. All of the arts are free, and um, so in numbers, it's about three thousand people from fifty-eight countries. We've got one hundred and thirty communities, so you could think of um, so. You don't have to live in, like there might be a community gathering of musicians and some of artists. You don't have to be in any particular community. You can create your own community. So you can see it's very independent and creative. Um, I'm in one community called Maitria. That's where mine is. It's very central. It's residential. It's full of kids. Um, and that's just where, where I am. Ayala, who is there, she stayed in another community, um, a few different communities at times. And we have at, at any one time about 1,200 volunteers there. Um, and a lot of those volunteers graduate on to become newcomers and then join the community. It's Everyone works their way in. You, you can't really buy your way in. You can buy your way in. I, I mean, donate your way in. You can, but it's not just like that, you know, where you can just buy your way in. Um, if you're unable to contribute in time, you can contribute in kind or through money to the community. But the idea is that everyone contributes in the spirit of the community. So we planted three million trees, about five square kilometers of trees. So there was nothing. There were one or two sort of trees in the sparse landscape. And it's got 153 commercial units. Those generate about a million dollars a year of revenue for the community. Um, and obviously, that goes for everything that we need. Um, it, it maintains the community. And this is after 53 years. You're not going to have that in the beginning. It's going to take time to get there. Um, we've got 31 in international centers so they're around the world and 400 acres of farmland. Um, 24 farms, and our largest farm is one called Anapona. They are a um, millet. They're growing their heirloom millets. It's called Varagu, and um, the heirloom um, rices. Tamil Nadu had its own very beautiful, very nutritious um, rices. And the millet that was traditional in that area, which the villagers, what happened is during the sort of industrialization of agriculture, they thought this was like poor man's food. But now there's a full circle, of, of course, going back to these ancient crops um, and heirloom crops. And there's a lot of grassroots um, work protecting seeds in Oroville. And uh, they found that these millets are the most nutritious things you could possibly eat, for example. It's called ragi, the one millet. You make a beautiful like, pup from it, a porridge. And our outreach, so we have 800 students in school, um, in three schools, and we have six educational centers. So it's not just for kids, it's also adult education. Um, and then we have 80 villages that we've adopted and work with. 36 educational centers, six health facilities, self-help groups, and then there's patients that we treat for free. So we offer free medical care. And then we also have employees. So this is all done by this community. Um, and this was a map one of our volunteers did called Anatomy of an Eco Village. It takes some time to study, but it's kind of, we wanted to just make it very visual of what's there in an eco village. So you can, it's always nice if you want to create something to be able to visualize it, as, as you all know. So this was the anatomy of an eco-village. So five years ago, I created a project called Seed. I was actually in the Cedarburg looking for a name for the project. And it came to me um, as a research project. We had been doing this research. We'd been studying Oroville as a blueprint and then looking at other communities and seeing what's a successful model that we can sort of duplicate and have these communities the next 100 years um, spreading around the world. And there are organizations that are doing amazing work, like GEN, Global, Global Eco-Village Network. Um, but they don't have one specific blueprint. They really work. They do do workshops and they do training, and it's really good. Daniel Greenberg is one of the founders 
um, he is living in Orville now, and um, it's there's some overlaps with Cedar and Jen, but um, here the idea is really to handhold and blueprint, a bit like say the Waldorf Foundation does with a new school. They handhold you, they, they give you the blueprint, they give you the resources, <laughs> the mentorship, and then help you to take flight and then fly on your own. But they don't own you, they just um, help you, basically. So it started in 2015 with three of our volunteers, Titian and uh, Magali and Jayashree, and um, we started doing this research. And this idea of CEDA was to nurture and create this network of interlinked communities like Orville. And it really came from the question, people kept coming to Orville and saying, like, why is there only one place like this? I mean, I knew of other places like Damahur, Findhorn, Tamera, and m many of you will know eco-villages, but I knew nothing on the scale and um, complexity and also diversity and the depth of Orville. And, and I haven't yet seen. If there is Sorry. something out there, then let me know, of course. Um, so this was this is the vision for next hundred years. It's this interlinked network. Um, Jen already has this loose network, but um, it's very it's it's a very loose. We want to make something much tighter where you can actually move between these communities and exchange. Like I have a home in Orville, and I can come to the one in Monkey Valley and just exchange. There's no need for buying a house in Cape Town. I'm just moving between a community, and we can also move goods and items. So the more diversity we have of production of skills of um, human resources, the less we're going to need from outside. It becomes a sort of independent sort of network. And then, of course, it can be Trans-Africa, it can be um, Trans-South Africa. And of course, specifically focused on today is in the Western Cape. And this is where I've been looking at the zoning laws and looking at the different municipalities and saying, what is feasible? Um, because when I arrived in Oroville, which was 15 years ago, I took a lot for granted. Like how easy it was just to build a house, how easy it was just to say, you want to make a school there? Make a school there. Um, we had our own approval process, but we didn't have to, we didn't have um, the government um, involved in every decision. We had our own governance, basically. And um, so studying it for South Africa, we obviously have to understand there are, there are limits and rules, and we have to um, understand the rules and the limits. Um, the name came in the, in the Cedarburg because the, a tree is a community, and basically um, the cedar tree particularly can live, although the cedar tree in the Cedarburg is not really a cedar off the record, it's a cypress, but the, um, it's still called a cedar tree, and it smells like cedar, um, but they can live up to a thousand years, so you, I wanted a name that would be sustainable, and also it has a kind of funny um, naming in Sanskrit, cedar means um, to perfect something, basically. Um, to mean something that's been perfected. So Orville's also moving towards this perfection of society, basically. And the inspiration for this project was very much so Orville, where I've spent a large percent of my life. Um, and then Kibbutz also was very successful in duplicating communities. And on a practical level, they were r really good. And we worked closely with the Institute in Haifa that studies the Kibbutz. And they've done a lot of um, comparative studies and assessments. And Findhorn is another one that's linked to Orville. We have a Findhorn house in Orville where people can come and exchange. And in th 1937, Yogananda had this idea of um, World Brotherhood Colonies, where he said 50 families get together and pool your resources for one year, which is what we're going to be doing after the meeting, and um, then create a community, basically. And then also linked to my work with UCT is the traditional San and the Khoi um, communities. They were living very communally and very connected. And um, to link it with these first people also, particularly in South Africa. And I've had the um, incredible um, fortune of working with the San and the Khoi unit at UCT now and understanding the community, understanding the languages, understanding um, the need um, there. And it's, it's been a very beautiful journey. So we did this comparative research and we did all these interviews. We sent them out to the um, sort of elders in many of these communities and we compared how do they deal with identity, how do they deal with their vision, how do they deal with money, ownership um, and the idea was really to distill an ideal model um, and um, so th these are the, the other communities that we looked at basically, particularly Oroville but Fintorn, the Ananda which was in Italy where I also lived for uh, a brief time Kibbutz was very good on a practical level, as I said, and then also traditional communities. What can we learn and, and absorb from them? Um, so Findon has got about 500 people. It's much smaller. Um, and also international. Uh, there's a few South Africans there, and a lot that have visited there. And it started as a caravan park um, in 1962. So it's older than Oroville. Uh, 
ideals and the vision are very similar, like work is love in action. Orville, your work is a service for the greater good for humanity, for human unity and co-creation with nature. So ecology is a very strong theme there. And then inner listening. So these are all things that I think everyone would universally agree. And this is their, um, the three principles that they're based on. It's good to sort of see other models because we're going to come to that later in the talk. We do need vision, and we need a vision, basically, and that vision is what's going to draw us together, and that's what's going to bring people in alignment with what we're going to do, basically. And the kibbutz, um, it's, what was amazing is 40% of the agriculture today is from the kibbutzes. So um, if you think of South Africa, like farming is kind of under constant attack, and it, organic and natural farming is very labor intensive. So it would really, I mean, we've got about 40% unemployment, 30 to 40%. It would really be amazing if we could have these kibbutz type projects, even if we just did that. And, you know, um, it would be great for employment and also for the um, society. So this is a good model to keep in your um, radar. Um, I spent a year there, so I got to see life inside. It was very beautiful. It is Zionistic, obviously, so that's, it's not sort of universal and open like, like Oroville, but it does have its merits and it's worth studying. And our institute, we linked with this department in Haifa University to just um, look, look at the, the merits and also to study it. And what happened with kibbutz is, it, as, as Israel got more capitalistically orientated and less socialistic, it kind of went through a transformation where there was um, many people leaving the kibbutz, especially the younger generations. And now it's gone through a revival, particularly in the last year and a half. People are going, wow. In COVID, people were like, you know, we want to be in places where we are um, more autonomous and we're not in big urban centers. People wanted to be in community, basically, and <coughs> in um, green spaces. And there are some eco kibbutzes um, that, that are there. So this is just one of the, and then I mentioned the Brotherhood um, colonies. So these are very small communities. The particular ones are in America and in um, Italy, and there's one in India also. They're very small, um, but the idea started also to, uh, this, this idea was there, also coming from Yogananda, and many others have had the idea, of course. Um, so what we did in the last um, lectures, we looked at Oravo as a blueprint, and what I'm going to do in this phase now is I'm going to look into the feasibility of making something happen in South Africa. It is a bit of a mountain to climb, but if we have a team and we're unified with the vision, we can easily do it. Um, so I'm just going back to 1912. So Oroville started in 1968. The mother, uh, she was a French um, lady called Mira Alfasa. She be later became called the mother. Um, she had this idea in 1912. And I'm just showing you that the idea actually started decades before Oroville actually actualized. And she was talking about human unity. This was in a talk in Paris. And she wanted to create an environment favorable to the flowering of the growth of the individual. Um, and these are two things that Oroville's definitely achieving human unity and also this place where you can grow. Um, and then she had this dream in 1954. The dream, if I just distill it, is basically a place on earth where no one claims that it is owned. So it's a very um, a magnificent sort of ideal. Um, and it would be used to, um, children can grow integrally, conquer the cause of sufferings and misery. Education is to enrich yourself. There's beauty. Money is no longer the overriding force of the place and work is a place to express yourself and also to serve and to give back um, and there will be collaboration and brotherhood so we're going back to the imagine idea and this was the dream in 1954 that started Oroville and um, it turned into a charter where Oroville belongs to humanity as a whole it's a place of unending education constant progress it's a bridge between the past and the future, taking the best of the past and also um, looking very much so forward. My work was with Sanskrit, but I was using digital humanities, computational linguistics. I was using the amazing gift economy of Orville, where we have volunteers wanting to contribute. And um, it was very much in the 21st century. It wasn't, I wasn't stuck just with the manuscripts of Sanskrit from the last millennia, but I was working in digitization. And, um, and then it's a place of research, basically, and a place of actual human unity. So in 1964, the mother wrote, are you ready? So it's like, this is what we also, at the stage, we could say we act for South Africa. Are we ready for doing something? I think there is a readiness there. And it was born in 1968. But at age two, in 1970, and I was going through the archives now to see the history, they were saying things are developing very slowly. It was still this barren plain, as you can see there. 
Um, they were unsure about the legal status. They were still figuring out how to structure it legally. What's it going to be? Um, there was an issue with funding. They hadn't bought the land. It was up in the air. And the land was barren. And people were complaining there's no shade even. This is a hot southeast India. So this is age two. Um, so the reason I'm focusing on this is that there will be difficulties and there will be challenges. This is uh, two years after birthing the idea and inaugurating the community. And then 2021, we come to this. This is what we have as a community. This is one of our gatherings, a bonfire and um, sitting. I mean, this, um, and our land is full of trees. Um, so all of those are forgotten now, but it's real what was there in 1970. And our economy, I worked out it's around $11 million in the financial year of 2017-18. About seven came from donations, two and a half from grants, and um, a million was self-generated. Um, and that's a fair bit of money in India, where um, uh, everything is, say, three to four times less expensive than South Africa. So you can do the numbers in your head of the spending power and what that's worth. And that's every year. That's not just, um, yeah. Um, and this is in 2020. This is our spirulina farm. Just to give an idea of, you know, it turned into something else. So the last talk I touched on the phases. So what we're going to focus on is the pioneer phase, really. This is the most difficult phase. Um, we've got to establish the vision. We've got to create the guidelines. And um, we're going to look at Oroville a bit later on, on the vision and guidelines. And we have to create a legal structure um, for the community. Um, and then we need to gather people together. So I would suggest at that phase, once we finalize the vision and guidelines and the legal structure, we actually have a conference. Oroville, I, I was reading the archives um, yesterday, they had a two-day seminar before creating the community. Um, and that sort of brought people together and also saw who was available to give their time more capacity. So it might be good um, when we can do a proper conference to do a one or two-day conference. Um, we could ask Judy about a place to do the conference. Yeah, so. yeah. And, um, and then we need to create teams, like teams that are going to take responsibility for different sections of decision making, leadership, and the groups. Um, and also conflict resolution. This is an important one to bake in from the beginning. Um, we have that in Oroville, and it's very useful. It doesn't mean the conflict always gets resolved, but you have tools to resolve the conflict. Um, it doesn't guarantee resolution of conflict. It just get, gives you tools to resolve, but you need those tools. And then, of course, we would create one- and five-year plans and um, obtain some land um, and then d deal with all the issues. I'm not going to go into the growing up and mature phase because that's for later, but we're going to focus on the pioneer, pioneer phase. So this is what things look like in the pioneer phase. Often is it's just barren land. In South Africa, we might be lucky to get land with things on it. Um, they could have houses or buildings or structures, um, and um, it all depends, you know, where, where we do root it. And it could also be a existing project that we're adopting. Um, so you've got to name the project. I mean, you don't have to, <laughs> but you're going to need to name it, um, basically, at some stage. Um, so Oroville had this symbol, and it's called Oroville, um, which means like city of dawn. So it was like the dawning of a new awareness, a new consciousness. I just played with an idea. I mean, this is, this is when I was working with the San and the Koi, the first development of abstract thought. This is the earliest art. It's 70,000 years old, and it's from Blombos Cave near Tostolbe. It's just a symbol. I'm just using it as an abstract symbol, but just gives an example of, you know, taking a symbol that doesn't necessarily, you know, um, belong to any particular um, group, um, but it represents something, basically. But um, so naming and giving a, a logo is, is, is good at this phase. And then solidifying your vision. So in Oroville, the vision is basically the, the main core of the vision is human unity. And then there are secondary visions. And I think a lot of these are very common for people who want community. So to so really live consciously, this idea of all life is yoga. So, you know, looking for this oneness, basically you could say oneness, you could sum it up. It doesn't belong to anyone, so it's not someone's community. Um, it belongs to the to humanity as a whole, we said, but legally it belongs to the Oroville Foundation. Um, so children can develop integrally um, and also safely. This is a very, very, very important point for South Africa. And education is for enrichment and there's this lifelong learning. Celebration of beauty. These are just the, the vision of Oroville. And money is not the sovereign lord and your work is for high expression and service. There's collaboration, so this is in your vision. You can write these things down when you create your vision. And it's also bridging the past and future. 
and it's a place of research. Um, so we would have to, I mean, we don't have to agree on everything that Orville's done, and we can look at Fintorn, we can look at many others, but what we need to agree on is having a vision, basically, for the project. The vision is really what allows people to join in and be part of it. Um, if you just say we're going to make like an eco-village and it's too vague, it's very hard for people to know what they're getting involved in. If you see that this human unity and this is one of your aspirations or you see that there's yoga and this is one of your aspirations and you see that it's moving away from money as the predominant force and you're aspiring for moving away from money. Um, and ironically, when you move away from money, you actually attract much more money, as you can see. Um, then this is really where people will be coming and unifying. So we need to, and this will happen in the conference, people will obviously come with their ideas for the vision and then you'll distill that into the group vision because every individual might have, and there would definitely be overlap. Um, uh, one person might have one idea stronger and then you need, to, the conference will allow you to make decisions on what is our vision for the community. Um, we can obviously model on Orville, we can enhance it, we can adapt it, we can change it. But I'm giving this, so on the left is what Orville's done but we need to create a vision. And we also need to create guidelines. So, as I said, Orville has no rules per se um, like that, but we have some yeah. guidelines which you you agree upon by living there, basically. They're common understandings, and I'm just going to share what they are in Orville. So the guideline is that, obviously, you're in alignment with the charter and the dream. So whatever the vision is, there is an alignment. So you're not coming there and then, you know, in totally a different alignment. Um, and the other guideline is there's no rules. Um, so you're, you're making a guideline that there's no rules. And there's no religion. I mean, of course, you, you can do your Shabbat and you can have your Christmas and we have all sorts of religious celebrations, but religion is not a theme in the, um, in the community. So we don't have churches or places of worship, but you can, you have your freedom to, to do whatever you wish to do, but it's not a theme of the place. Um, and the guideline is to contribute, and you can con contribute in many different ways. You don't have to, you know, contribute um, through labor. It can be subtle ways. There, there are many different ways to contribute. Um, and um, there's no discrimination. This is one of our guidelines. These are pretty universal things. No politics. So you can't be in a political party in, in Oroville. Um, so you, generally it's not encouraged. I mean, these are also, as there's no rules, so the, the no rules rule overrules these, but these are the guidelines, basically. They're quite light, okay. And no drugs, um, so that's also a law of India, so we, we, we work uh, with the laws of India, and we respect that. Um, no physical violence, no ownership of immovable assets, um, and respect for culture of all nations. This also lines up with the no discrimination. So consumption of alcohol is discouraged, so there's no pubs or in our communal eating places, you can't get alcohol. Um, children aren't exposed to like, sort of adults drinking, but of course at home maybe people do do what they want to do. So it it's also goes along with the no rules, but it's, 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 a, it's discouraged um, basically in public. It's not a theme of the place. Um, and we try to resolve conflicts internally. This is another guideline. Like if we have a dispute, we don't just rush off to the police. We try to resolve it, obviously if it needs legal or police involvement, we do that definitely. We have an oral security that deals, that's a liaison with the police. But we try to resolve it internally. This is one of the guidelines. And then obviously to abide by the laws. So the reason I'm highlighting this, this is what Oroville has distilled as its guidelines. And it's successful, it's working very well. And then in that conference that we would organize, we would all bring what are the guidelines that we would want to live within in a community. And then there will be some compromises. Some people might want a vegetarian community, for example, and some people might not. And then you've obviously, you know, some might want a vegan community. Some might um, want some other um, ideas there. And this is really where you solidify that so that when people join the community, you come on to a, a broad set of guidelines and a vision that's already crystallized. So our homework is to crystallize the guidelines for the community that will happen in South Africa. And then there's the legal. So Orville has a statutory body, um, which is basically like a trust, but it, it got um, another status, but like a university or trust. It's something unique. Um, the government of India created a, sort of a unique structure for Orville, which has been really useful because as a South African, I can live there very comfortably and easily with the visas because of the special status. So it's opened up a lot of doors. Um, but in South Africa, the two structures that I was looking at is your not-for-profit trust and a not-for-profit comp company. They both have strengths and weaknesses, so we would need to see which is the best and also have a legal team that advises us. And ideally, 
it would become a PB, PBO um, that would open up a lot of doors and is obviously a public, any community you start is of public benefit. Um, and in the public benefit um, criteria, it, it fulfills many of them, but under research and also conservation, it could easily qualify. Um, so basically, we need to create a legal structure, and that would obviously have some compliance and some bureau bureaucracies there, but that has to be done basically for the community. Um, so the ownership in, in all, of all, all immovable assets, so I have a home there, but I don't own it, I steward it. Um, and even if you bought, in inverted commas, a home, you don't buy it, you're stewarding it, you're donating to Oroville to a central fund, and the home is being exchanged to you. You don't have to donate to get a home, you can also get a home for free there. Um, you can, um, basically there's many different structures, but that was the structure I chose. Um, there was a new project that had been built, it needed, someone had to pay for it, and I put money in, and then I had a home. Um, and so the ownership of my home is by Oroville. Um, I have stewardship rights of that, and my children will um, inherit that, basically, if they want to live in Oroville. If not, then it goes back into the community. And um, the entry and exit guidelines need to be also solidified. Um, so this is how we do it in Oroville. We have a, a group or a team that looks after entry and exit, and then we have a policy. And there's three phases. There's the exploration phase, where you just come as a guest or volunteer, and you're just sort of exploring and seeing what's going on. And we um, encourage that. That's essential to understand. You need to know like what's happening there. Then there's the newcomer phase, which is about a year. That's where you basically are trying to live there and see if you can live there. And if, you, um, if all goes well, then you become a resident. So um, it takes about a year and a bit to become a resident of the community. In the newcomer phase, you are doing some work or service for the community, and you need to be staying somewhere in the community, um, inside of Oroville. So, um, basically, in the newcomer phase, you should be joining on agreement with the vision and the guidelines. So you're coming in to what we said. We've solidified the vision and the guidelines, and you're coming into that. Um, if we're starting now, obviously, we don't have an established community to. Um, we, we need to decide like who's already in the community. So our pioneers would basically be joined as newcomers, but they'd still go through that process of one year trial. You still e you don't get a special status just because you're starting it. So you would still be having a year to decide if you're going to graduate, and then collectively we would decide who is. Um, we would have some sort of policies and and. You need some systems. Um, in Orville, it's like this. There's an entry group that sort of liaises with who wants to join. And then it gets announced in a, uh, for a month. And if there's no objections or complaints that um, are worthy, then the person becomes a member of the community. It's that simple. Um, so we would need the entry and exit um, policies, basically, for the, for the, uh, for the um, community. And these have to be solidified in that conference, basically. Um, and that will be written into the guidelines and the agreements. We will have this. It doesn't have to be very complex um, uh, and, and detailed. It just has to be clear, basically. That's the most important. Mm -hmm. So housing. So I've already said um, everything is owned by the community in Oroville. You steward your house, um, and it, it passes on to kids. And when you donate for a house, a percent, 13% goes to different places. 10% goes for collective housing. So one-tenth of when I bought my house, one tenth went, and someone, you know, it, ten people eventually bought a house for someone else together. So the argument there, I mean, this is just the system we've agreed upon. We can change that for what we're going to form here. But um, that's very nice because not everyone can afford to buy a house, but they could afford to work for the community and to give their life um, or their time and their energy or their skills. So you want to also be able to give free housing. Um, but obviously, some people will have means to buy houses, and both are needed, basically. Um, because you need to create houses initially. And then we give a percent for like land, for buying new land, and also for preserving land, and for the general central fund, and for town planning. So a little percent goes there. It's almost like an internal um, direction of funds. This is when you buy a house. Um, so in the model I'm going to show you, uh, we've taken a land in Stanford that we're looking at, um, just for one model. It's just really like a case study. Um, there already are three dwellings there, one large that could possibly be two or three families, and then two that could be one family each, or couples, or individuals. Um, what you would do, and what we do in Orville, is we evaluate it just on the brick and mortar value. So we just say, what is it actually worth per square meter? I think it's something between maybe eight to 13,000 a square meter in South Africa. I, I, I've got some ideas. 
but you value it, and then that goes up for inverted commas transfer for stewardship. But all the properties are owned by the trust, um, and I'll show you that structure. So if if we just get a land with nothing on it, then it's easy. Um, then we just start this policy, and we have to build obviously all the housing that we're going to need on the on the community. But if there is already existing, we just value it. We don't value the land or the collective infrastructure. We just value it fairly based on the actual value of that building. And when you want to leave and exit, you just um, get it revalued at the current value of that building, and then you um, exchange it with someone who wants to come in and take it. So that's how we're doing it in Orville. It seems to work quite well. Obviously, if we can, in the conference, find a better model, that's good. We have already a working model, but this is how housing works in Orville. And also offices. There are collective offices, but sometimes people want an individual office, so it falls under the housing policy. So this is our organogram and how we make decisions. We've got the Orville Foundation, which is a sort of trust or not-for-profit. And then we've got an international advisory council, which is people that are just, they're like elders or mentors. They're there, they're, they might be experts in ecology or human unity. They might have um, some public role. Um, they're people that understand the vision and the guidelines very deeply of the community. And they're there, they're not part of the community. They're not living there, but they are advising, basically. And then we've got a governing board in Orville, and we've got a residence assembly, which is, residence assembly has the final say. That's everyone deciding together by voting, basically. Um, and what I thought would work here is you have a trust or not-for-profit um, company, and you have your advisors and mentors, at least five, I would suggest. And then you have your residents, um, and then you have groups, which is formed of residents, and you have a governance team, which is just another group. It's not higher or lower. It's just the group of people that are over overseeing different aspects of governance and making different decisions. Um, and then under that, you have all your activities and projects of the community. And we can decide in the conference how voting is done. It can be by majority, or there could be some waiting on voting based on how long you're there. In Orville, it's just done on um, majority, basically. I can get the exact system. It's pretty standard um, things. But the idea is that everyone should have a say in the community. And everyone should be in alignment with the vision and the guidelines. So this is the organogram. Um, and then we do need oversight and conflict resolution. Often people think of this as an afterthought. But in Auroville, um it's good to have seen how we've had this. So we've got all these tools for conflict resolution. You are going to have conflict. If two people can't stay together, um, I think in Belgium the divorce rate is 66%, then how can you have 100 people or 1,000 people or you know, 3,000 people in harmony. So you do have to think about this from the beginning. You need tools, and you also need oversight um, to just check that the community and it needs to be independent, that it's on alignment with its guidelines and its vision that, that we've agreed upon. And the next step that I mentioned, and this is also what Orville Interesting did, is they did this two-day conference before forming Orville, and it was gathering. It was like basically putting the word out, like, no, everyone's gathering to hear about doing communities in South Africa. It was gathering with a particular purpose of creating clear vision, clear guidelines, um, creating the team for the creating the legal structures, seeing what people we have. We're going to need, obviously, finance people, legal people, town planning liaisons, um, people that are experts with building or different aspects of ecology and architecture. So just seeing what resources are there in the initial group and what we don't have, where we can bring in uh, people from Oroville. We can also create a bridge with incredible um, team, teams in Oroville. And then I think the conference would be the next step, basically. Um, and possibly having a base um, in Cape Town, which is going to sort of be the sort of base camp where you're going to create this community or more communities. I'll show you how we can create more communities um, from. So people often say about finance and funding, like how do you get, Oroville's already at this point of maturity, and you saw in the beginning in 1970 there was uncertainty. The way you do it is you create this body that's not one person asking for money. It's basically a body that's a, the vision and the guidelines. So the entity needs to be there that can receive the money and also get PBO status so you can receive public um, funds and also give people tax um, deductible donation ability. Um, and then you do need to have a fundraising team initially. And one way to catalyze it is, I showed you the stewardship model that we do in Orville. So, so let's say we decide on a land that already has houses that can be stewarded. We can already have the money that's stewarding those buildings as the initial funding to purchase the land. It can be structured in that way. Um, if we find a suitable land where the value is proportionate, and I'll show you an example, 
um, it could fly, this idea. It's not going to give you the money that you're going to need to operate and to run it in the initial phases. You're still going to have operating costs, but it'll allow you to secure land. And it's a model to securing land um, and possibly duplicate this model. And then obviously to establish income generating projects for the community um, as soon as possible. So these are your teams. This is 51 teams and groups. I did a survey of what we have in Oroville that are sort of operating. Um, some of these could just be one or two people and some could be more. The green ones are what we need in the initial phase of getting going. It's basically finance. We need a team that understands finance um, and is good with finance and um, can sort of um, deal with finance. And then entry and exit, we'll need that because people are going to want to join and they're going to want to leave. We'll probably not leave in the beginning. They're going to want to join probably um, in the start. And then fundraising is critical in the beginning. Um, growing the community. So like how can we reach more people? Often there's many people out there that want to come and live in community, but they don't know that there is a community they can live in. Um, Oroville doesn't really do any marketing or advertising, um, but people find it. I found it. Um, so finding people that want to join in with the community or communities is very important. And you'll need a legal team initially that deals with um, the legal aspects. And you'll need a governance um, and um, this constitution and the, the vision and the guidelines, basically. You'll need those teams. So those are your critical teams for starting. And then once you've sort of got your land, you're going to need housing, energy, your land and zoning team. You'll need security, farming, waste, water, roads and paths, seeds and nursery, town planning, volunteers, because you want to bring in also a workforce initially and also helps to grow the community. You'll need a communal kitchen, a team, a construction and maintenance, possibly um, meditation initially to, to bring in. Also, just to have that start with a central place to, for silence. And then as you're growing, you bring in all the other things. I won't go through everything, but um, it's basically all the other aspects um, that you're going to have to deal with. Um, Can you go through community. all of them? Because some people Okay, sure. So it. there's outreach. So outreach was a big one because a lot of people think you start the community and you start outreach immediately. You can, of course, do that. But the idea is to stabilize and grow the community and then start your charitable or your outreach works, whatever they may be. Um, and then arts, youth, education, guests, so receiving guests, having um, guests come and stay. Industry and commerce, so this is really conscious, sustainable industry and commerce. Accessibility, um, transport, communication, digital and internet. This also includes, um, so your fiber throughout the community. Um, many people don't want to have um, uh, non-ionizing radiations. Um, in Orville we have different zones, like blue zones and non-blue zones. So these could be in your policies when you form your policies. Health, elders, sports, forest, birth, ecology, research, community exchange. So this is exchanging between other communities where you can have people going to Oroville and people coming from Oroville and bringing know-how and kids at school you know, doing these exchanges. And then a liaison with the government. As you grow up, you're going to need to um, liaise with the government in the um, Western Cape, for example. And then your cooperatives for your community, your gas and your biofuel, clothing and um, linen. We have like a sort of a not-for-profit clothing service in Orville um, called Nandini, and then we have a not-for-profit supermarket service, which is um, there for the as a kind of cooperative. And um, newcomers, you'll need a service dealing with sort of new people to help them with all their needs. And um, library, internal newsletter, so like just communication internally, what's going on. Um, food processing, that also goes along with the cooperatives, but it's you're growing, say, too much mango, you dry them and you make it into different products, compotain and so forth. Um, pesticide reduction is a big one in South Africa because a lot of the farm areas where we might go, and we have this in Oroville also, um, are heavily spraying. So you want to sort of have an outreach where you handhold and you have a team working with farmers and showing them and maybe even creating cooperatives to buy their products in exchange for um, hand-holding them to go organic because um, you don't really want um, pesticides blowing into uh, eco-village. It's not ideal. So you do need to think of this. This is why we put it in. And we have this in Orville with the spraying of the cashew trees. We, we had a pesticide reduction outreach. And then building biology. Death, obviously something you'll need to deal with in archive, um, where you archive, archive for the community. Media and public relations. And then conflict resolution and oversight. So these were the 51 um, things. There might be more and there might be others that people want to add. Um,
So zoning was the big one. When I was looking quite idealistically at South Africa, I was saying, oh, okay, you can just take a farm. Um, I grew up with a family farm in Wellington, it was 50 acres. Um, but there's actually quite strict rules with farms. And um, you, you do have, like, say, golf estates or housing estates, and they are kind of like communities, but they're not eco-villages. Some of them are maybe more eco, like out in front there might be some that are building more ecologically. Um, so there isn't really a zone in South Africa for eco-village. Um, in um, we'll come to questions at the end. In um, Canada and Germany, they have worked with local municipalities and actually created an eco village zone, um, which we've got as models. Um, South Africa has done it with Honeyville. I don't know if anyone knows Honeyville, but they've done. Um, it took nine years, but it's 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 a precedent and it's a premise for doing it again. Um, Lindock has got something in between. We're gonna sh I'll show you what, what they've done and Campbell have agri zoning, but they've managed to get um, permission, special permission, because they've got elements of a community. They've got residents, they've got um, a kind of a rehabilitation facility, they've got volunteers, they've got guests, they've got farming, they've got a school. Um, so Campbell was the first one that I looked at. <coughs> There's a few Campbells. Um, so they've got agricultural zoning. They've actually got a few earths that they've joined together, and then one is zoned as education, and two are as agriculture. But they've worked with Obviously, it's a project of immense benefit um, if anyone's been there. And they've obviously worked with the local council, and they've got special permission and to <coughs> do what they need. And it's also set up as a not-for-profit. So this is a, one model um, that I wanted to share. And Lindoch is the other one. We're actually going there tomorrow. Uh, it's Mark Swilling, who is one of the founders. Um, they didn't have Agri, if I remember correctly, but he's got a special management zone trust and he's created a Householders Association. So there they do actually have ownership, a kind of ownership. It's kind of like a housing estate, but it's all inside of an eco-village, and they've got quite a bit of autonomy. He said they basically have their own, they pass their plans internally, and then they just get signed at the municipality. So they function quite autonomously. Um, so it's an interesting model to study for South Africa, and it's worth visiting and also partnering, and you know, because they're studying sustainability systematically. They're doing academic sort of understanding of it, so it's, it will be very useful. Um, and then Honeyville is the interesting one um, that a friend in Hot Bay, Dana, told me about. And they spent nine years to rezone um, a resort two. They've got the resort two zoning. I don't know which one you have here, resort one or resort two. Um, but the resort two zoning became permaculture and eco-village, and they got permission for 35 ecological housing. So this is a nice example. It's in the Eastern Cape. Um, yeah, so this is ready to roll as an eco-village, so it's good. The zoning is really something that we have to, um, of course we can fly um, for a while below the radar, it's not, I don't recommend it. Um, Lala Panzi, I think, might be doing that, I'm not sure if they have a special, but they've done this kind of scone shack and shacks, um, and sort of temporary structures. Um, but according to the rules that I read, if it's over a Wendy house size, you do need to have it officially, but maybe there are some special arrangements that they have. Um, so this is in Cape Point. It's one of the farms. They've got 11 people living on a community there. Um, so to look at it in a practical term, there is a farm um, owned by a f uh, lady called Rishi from Denmark who spent a lot of time in Oroville, and she tried to start a community there. Um, it was just her and her partner. And it came up through this eco-village group with... Um, um, that was looking for land, it came up as available. And um, she really would like to see it become an eco-village. Um, Sorry, where is this? This is in Stanford, um, no. just out of Stanford. Um, it's 100 hectares, so it's quite big. It's zoned as agri, basically, so it's a farm at the moment. Um, it has one large house and two unofficial um, houses that were workers' cottages, and they are not actually on the plans. They need to be rectified. Um, but we've been looking at this as a model. This is what it is currently. You can see this map that um, our team in Oroville drew. One of our volunteers drew it for us. It just shows you what's there. It's got olives. Um, it, it's not really running as a farm. It's more running as a kind of yoga center now. It's got a very large, about 400 square meter dwelling, um, which is being rented out. It's got two cottages. But we looked at this as a model, and I've been speaking with um, town planners in Hermanus that have experience with, um, is it called Platbos, if I'm not mistaken, out there? So Platbos or Platbos, yeah. And with a few similar projects, not an eco-village yet, but they're very excited to work on one. 
and we've been looking into the feasibility of doing a community on this land. Whether it's this farm or any other farm, um, we need to go through these process of seeing how it's possible. Um, so this falls under Overstrand, and I just drew roughly, this is just a, a, a penciled in like what could be done. This is obviously um, a very large farm, it's 100 hectares, um, and um, there could be parking, you could have some safety and fire, because you, you've got to think of fires, so you need some sort of firefighting and some fire awareness. Um, there, the, there are fires that come time every few years. And then you could have a, a visitor center at the beginning, and then guest accommodation on the periphery. This is as you come in. Um, the mountains are here, and then the ocean is that way, about 12 kilometers. And this is all uh, wilderness areas. If you walk over the mountain, you come to Tesla Dull. Tesla's Dull. Tesla's Dull, over the mountain. Yeah. Um, and then some camping. So I s had a call today with the zoning. Everything on this map is feasible. Obviously, it needs to be approved, and we need to work, and there might be some back and forth. So there would be some camping. There would be an educational um, area in the forest. There's a beautiful forest there. Um, the group that I was working with, the EV Collective group with Daniel and Rain, they thought of having a little school, a forest school in the forest. And then um, you could have a little circus, dance, art, and music. Um, a sports facility there. And then telescope therapy areas up there. It leads onto forest trails, and you have access and friendly relations into that land there. So you've got complete wilderness on your doorstep. And anyone who's walked in Stanford, you can walk very safely, and it's very beautiful and very protected. And um, there's a spring coming in, so I would pro probably put hot springs there. Um, solar panels and a communal kitchen. Um, there's three dams in this land. Then a residential area. I'll explain to you the limitations shortly of how much residential and so forth. Um, there's a fire pit already there. There's already a shed there. We would have a farming area, um, um, which would obviously be permaculture and... Um, food forests and medicinal gardens, your own nurseries and your seed banks, like we have in Oroville. You could do aquaculture like spirulina, and then volunteer accommodation, which would, in the zoning, come under laborers' cottages, and uh, office co-work library, uh, amphitheater for like concerts, events that you're doing for the community, and um, your little industry, which could be chocolate making, or whatever you want to do, that could be um, a little complex there. Um, and your cooperative, and then there's camping. This is just a sketch. It's very quick. I'm not an expert in town planning, or um, it will be obviously worked through. But this would be in the conference. You would, once we've seen the feasibility of a particular land, so it's in the feasibility phase with the town planners now to see if it's feasible to do this. They're actually going to meet with a contact in the municipality and take um, sort of the list of what what would be there and see if it's feasible. Obviously, if anyone after the meeting has suggestions of something that's omitted or needs to change, you can. But this is a model for an eco-village. Um, so the law says you can have seven residences. So we worked out around 35 people um, could stay there on one farm. And for the bigger picture, the idea is to take farms and then join them together, basically. So those 130 communities in the 3,000 people in Orville, each one I would see as a farm. So the idea is really to buy a farm, build the community, and then buy another farm, and then join them together. And they don't have to be geographically linked. They could just be in the same area, and they could even be in different parts of the country. Um, but this, the idea is to find a model that we could work with turning farms into something um, that's not just farming food. It's farming consciousness, farming people, farming ideas, farming research, and farming beauty, basically. So in this residential zone, we could have seven residences. Um, this is you're allowed uh, the main house, the manager's house, and then five additional, if, if they approve. <coughs> um, and then volunteers, we can have, actually, under the laborers' cottages, there's no real limit. It's based on what you want to do on the farm. So we're looking into five to ten cottages for um, volunteers or some dormitories and cottages. And then guest accommodation, you're allowed up to 14 people. You can go more, but then you need some sort of exemption from the, um, I think it's called NEMA, the environmental um, group. Um, so these are the guidelines for a farm. Camping also, um, you could do under educational. So you could have groups because the school that was going was going to have like school groups coming, camping, and being there. But there are some rules and guidelines. And the time it takes about 12 to 18 months. It could be shorter. We can accelerate it. It needs about 150 to 300 thousand rand for the um, zoning um, for the site plan to be approved. And then that you would basically be ready to roll with a potential eco village. Um, on this particular land. This is just an example. 
Um, and then I was looking at a stewardship model. This is just to put the idea out there. And we looked at how Oroville does it. So this already has a 460 square meter, sorry, this was, yeah, 460 square, square meter villa. It could be split up into a kind of complex with one to three families. And then it has a, one cottage of 110 and another of 167. So I just valued at 13,000 a square meter. Maybe that's too high or too low, I don't know. But that's just on the brick and mortar value. Um, obviously, we would get a quantity surveyor and get a valuer to come in and actually value it. And I just added that 13% there, and then it added it up for what you would actually do if you did the stewardship model. And then people would be not owning that, but they'd be coming in as a steward, like they are in Oroville, and they can leave and get that money out if someone else comes in as a steward. So um, you have the benefit of ownership without actually owning, and also you're giving to the greater good, that the community benefits. So you're, it's not just you're making a house somewhere and doing something nice, but you're actually making a project somewhere and helping South Africa and helping the world. So this is the model, and I think it could fly. Um, the f this particular farm was l originally listed for 15 million, but after negotiation and also understanding um, what purpose it would be for, it came to an amount of around eight, uh, no, sorry, nine or 10 million we were looking at. And if you add up the actual brick and mortar value at 13,000 square meter, we've already got 10 million. So the stewardship model of a existing farm could actually go, assuming we can get people who want to buy into the vision, the guidelines, and that particular model of stewardship. Um, I certainly would be interested if I had the money. Um, I think it's exciting. Um, this is this is um, uh, it's called Goodwill Mountain, basically. Goodwill Where is Mountain. it? It is uh, Stanford. Yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, well, ironically with Stanford. I was living there in 2000, so I got to know the area well. Of the f there's a lot of interesting and conscious projects out there. There's the Panthera project. There is um, Crystal Kloof. There's Blue Moon. There's the first cob houses in South Africa were built by a woman. Um, if anyone's been interested in um, eco-architecture, they've probably visited there. You've got these beautiful cob houses on Crystal Cliff, and there's abundant nature and waterfalls, and it's an extremely safe area um, in terms of violent crime and so forth. Um, so is for this kids near Crystal Cliff? Is yeah, this is, very, you can actually walk to Crystal Cliff, waterfalls and so forth from it. Um, so this farm is actually on the market, and it's kind of at the point where Rishi wants to sell it to the, a community. Um, and I've been looking at the models, and I stopped at this, about a month ago, I stopped at zoning, because I realized it's a showstopper. If you just buy the farm and think you can do a community there without rezoning, you're just going to build a community, and then they, in 30 days, they can come and demolish your building if they want to. So it's just too risky to do it that way. It's not worth it. So it's better to do all the zoning, do the site plan, and then build the community. Um, so this was the model that I worked on for Goodwill, but it could be any farm. Um, I was at Boschendal, which is, 20 times bigger than this farm. I mean, obviously, it's a massive, it was roads as fruit farms, but, you know, say the family who owned Boschendal, they're a billionaire family in London, saw what we did and want to um, duplicate it, they would be welcome to. We would have a precedent for a model of creating a community. Obviously, on Boschendal, you could do a, a huge community, just as an example. Um, and then the idea there was to expand modularly. So, I mean, a farm doesn't have to cost eight million. You could, it could be a million or two million or three. I mean, I'm not in touch with property prices, um, so it could be. Uh, le obviously, as you get out of the main areas or the tourist areas, it will it will reduce. If you go to New Bethesda, maybe it's much less, considerably less. Um, but then, of course, how many people in this room want to be in New Bethesda? That's the question you've got to ask. So that will come out in the conference. Some people want to be in New Bethesda and live there and be cut off. Some people want a reclusive place. Um, some people want to be within a few hours of a city where they've got loved ones, family, kids, grandkids. So r what I thought in the model is within an hour or two of a main city um, is more sensible at this stage. But obviously, once the movement creates lots of communities and becomes strong, we can have reclusive or retreat communities which are much more remote than New Bethesda. And, you know, there, of course, acquiring the land is uh, much easier. Um, but, of course, the reason that land is cheap is because it's just one sheep per 10 hectare, I can't remember the ratio, I was out in Sutherland, it's, I don't know, one sheep per 10 hectare, something like that, or I'm, I'm, I might be, t I'm not a sheep farmer, so I'm totally off, but it was a lot, it was like you need thousands of hectares for sheep, for example. Um, so here's the next step, so we need to establish the vision and the guidelines, establish the, who's going to found uh, and create the teams, we have to create a legal structure um, and a not-for-profit, um, with the guidelines, basically, and um, 
I would suggest like a one or two day conference just focused on this, creating an eco-village and it could be just focused on one particular eco-village like on Goodwill, we could say that's a nice one, let's do it there. Um, if the town planners come back and say it is all feasible after meeting with the municipality, if not then we could look into other lands. Um, but because there's already a land that wants to become an eco-village, it's obviously much easier than just going and finding some farmer who just wants to sell his farm at an exorbitant price. Um, fundraising is also very important. Um, if we just get a few thousand people to put in a few thousand rand, you've got a lot of money already in a movement. Um, so obviously that's just networking and getting word out there once people like the idea. And then selecting the site. Confirm the plan, do the zoning and the site plan work. I'm already doing some pre pre preliminary feasibility there. Um, and then confirm the model for funding the land. That's obviously your biggest expense in South Africa, is actually getting land initially. Um, it's a lot of money. It's a lot um, of hard work and time to earn that amount of money. So usually the people who have that money, um, you know, they've sacrificed a lot to get 8 or 10 or 20 million rand. Um, my question is, does the land have to cost that much? Um, can the land be donated? Um, could we find land through another channel, um, through some sort of alliance or a lease, or a farmer who's got too much land who wants to sort of 100-year lease off portion? Um, these are all ideas that can come up in the conference. It doesn't, it can be in kind. It doesn't have to always be through um, the conventional ec economics. Um, and then we start the work, grow, repeat, basically. So that's the... I don't call it the end, it's the beginning, and then what we'll do is um, jump into questions.